Are you glad to be in God's house? Can we make some noise for our social global family that's watching from around the world? Come on, y'all could do better than that. Second service, y'all be bougie. Love our social global family. Let us know in the chats where you're watching from. Not only that, we want to welcome all of our inmates that are watching this message right now on Pando. You're a part of our social fam. And we love you so much. We are in a series that we've simply been calling God Loves God Loves Blank. And I honestly believe that this is more than a series. This is something that God is really trying to get in our hearts. And this might be the most important series that we ever do as a church to understand that God loves blank. Because you cannot be a believer and not love well. This is a gospel of love. You take away all the commandments, take away all the scriptures, and you reduce it to two things. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. This is a gospel of love. It is central to what God has called us to do. So every week, we've been filling in the blank of God loves blank. We started off the series with God Loves Sinners, right at Strauss Square. How many were at that service at Strauss? It was unbelievable. It was an open heaven, literally. Over 300 people got baptized in that service. It was unbelievable. We started off the series saying God loves sinners, that the thing that connects every single one of us is that we are all sinners saved by grace, Uh, that there are really only two categories of people. There are lost and found, and you are one of those, and yet we serve a shepherd who will leave the 99 to go find the one. He'll go find the one. Why? Because God does not love us equally. He loves us uniquely. He loves you, crazy you, with all of your idiosyncrasies and all of your perks and all of your quirks. He loves us uniquely. God loves sinners. And then last week, we had Watch Party Sunday, and we had what I believe is a crucial and critical conversation that the church has got to have, because if the world is going to be loud about some stuff, the church cannot afford to be quiet about stuff. And so we had a conversation with Angel and Louise, and it was simply titled, God Loves the LGBTQ, and we heard their powerful testimonies of how they survived the Pulse nightclub shooting and how God delivered them from that lifestyle. And today we're gonna fill in another blank. We're gonna fill in another blank. And if you remember, we began this series by understanding that this series is not just about us comprehending God's love for us, although that is powerful. It is powerful to consider God's love for every single one of us. As a matter of fact, let's look at it in Romans chapter 5, verse number 8. I love this. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, if that don't make you shout and do the Holy Ghost two-step, I don't know what else will. To think that while we were sinners... Christ loved us and died for us. He did not wait for you to get yourself together before he chose to love you because you can't get yourself together. He demonstrated his love for us. And how many know we could spend all of our lives and even eternity trying to contemplate God's unfathomable love? It's what made the Apostle Paul in Ephesians pray for the church at Ephesus. He says, I pray that you would have the power to comprehend how wide, how long, how high, how deep the love of Christ is. We will spend forever trying to understand the longitude, the latitude, the circumference, and the scope of God's love. But this series is not just about us comprehending God's love for us. It is about God's love coming through us. That God's love has to come through every single one of us. So watch this. You cannot say you love God who you haven't seen. And you don't love the person sitting right next to you. Some of you hadn't even talked to your neighbor all service. Come on. That's what 60 Social is for. This is a gospel of love. So if God is perpetually filling in the blanks of his love, how many of you know we will have to as well? And I've learned it is easy to fill in the blank for the people that you already like. 
It's easy to fill in the blank of God loves the person that you're trying to get a connection with. Amen. But it's hard to fill in the blank for the people you can't stand. What do you do when God makes you fill in the blank for someone or some people group that you don't like? Because I have learned God will make you fill in the blank for the people you don't like. Newsflash, God loves your haters. Newsflash, God loves your ex. Oh, see, I don't like that. (laughs) Newsflash, God loves your boss. (laughs) It's so easy to fill in the blank for the people that you already like, that you already love. So I just want to warn you, if you want to leave now, this series is going to challenge you. This series is not for the weak. This series, first of all, is going to challenge the hypocrisy and the Pharisee in all of our hearts that wants to selectively pick and choose who we think deserves God's love. This series is going to challenge all of us. Not only that, this series is going to challenge us because of the climate and the culture in which we live. Because we live in a culture that defines love as the endorsement and the acceptance of people's sinful lifestyle. So they think that if you love me, you'll just accept me for who I am. But that is not what God has called us to do, nor has he called the church to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to live in the tension of truth and love. Truth and love. We have to speak the truth in love. But how many of you know we cannot sacrifice truth on the altar of love? We've got to live in the tension of grace and truth. And truth and love, that is the mandate, that is the clarion call that is on every single one of us as believers. So get ready to live in the tension of truth and love. Because hear me, God loves sinners, but God doesn't love sin because sin damages that which he loves. God loves the prostitute. God doesn't love prostitution. Because prostitution damages that which he loves. God loves the liar. God doesn't love lying because lying damages that which he loves. God loves the cheater. God doesn't love cheating because cheating damages that which he loves. And today we fill in another blank. And that is God loves addicts. God loves addicts. He doesn't love addiction because addiction damages that which he loves. And the reason I felt it was incumbent of all the blanks that we could fill in to put in this blank of addicts, because I can't think of anything more damaging, anything that mars the image of God, anything that causes more affliction and mass destruction than addiction. I don't care who you are in this room or watching online, every single person under the sound of my voice knows what it's like to deal with the pain of addiction. Whether you are the person that has the addiction or whether there's somebody in your life that is wrestling with addiction, it is something that affects every single one of us. As a matter of fact, the National Center for Drug Abuse says the United States is currently facing a major opioid crisis with a reported 2.1 million Americans suffering from opioid use disorder. Since the year 2000, nearly 1 million people have died of a drug overdose. Drug abuse and addiction has cost the United States over $700 billion annually in healthcare expenses crime-related costs, and lost workplace productivity. But how many of you know, we don't have to read all those stats. I could pass the microphone around today, and people in this room could tell you tragic stories of families torn apart, fathers who aren't at dinner tables, mothers who are gone, cousins who have died over this one issue of addiction. Here's what I learned about addiction, is that addiction does not discriminate. How many know addiction doesn't care whether you're young or you're old, 
whether you upper class, middle class, lower class, or no class at all, I have found that addiction is an equal opportunity employer. Addiction will place its hook in the mouth of any person that has breath in their body. How many know you can be educated and addicted? You can be illiterate and addicted. You can be famous and addicted. You can be nameless and have two Instagram followers and still be addicted. You can live in Highland Park and be addicted. You can be homeless and be addicted. You can have a hoopty and be addicted. You can be cruising in a Bentley and be addicted. I know people that know a whole lot of verses of scripture and got Leviticus memorized and they are addicted. I know people that don't even know John 3 16 and they are addicted. You can be an atheist and be addicted and hear me, wait for it, you can be in relationship with Jesus and still be addicted. You can love God with all of your heart and still be wrestling with an addiction. Hear me, you can be anointed and addicted. You can be highly gifted and addicted. As a matter of fact, some of the most gifted people we know are privately wrestling with secret addictions and people just embrace their gift and think that because their gift is okay, they are okay. And so they walk away from the spotlight with their strong gift and they wrestle in secret places with addiction because they worked on their gift, but they didn't work on their soul. And there's a difference between your gift and who you really are. And that's why you got to be careful who you turn up your nose and who you point your finger at and say, how could they? How can they live with themselves? You don't know who you could become if your soul was left unattended because I'm telling you, addiction can grip anybody. Addiction can grip the soul of any person, especially a soul that has been left unattended. Be careful what you say you'll never do because you don't know who you could become if you did not do the work of working on your soul. This is the challenge because life is hard and life will life on you sometimes and we all go through some things and even when I put my faith in Jesus, yes, my spirit which was dead came to life, but how many of you know my soul is being transformed? My soul that has my emotions and my will, it is being transformed day by day and every day is another battle and another fight to crucify my flesh and to surrender myself to God because the challenge of life is to fight the sin nature on the inside of us that would love for us to be mastered by something. Hear me. The reason why this message is critical for er body, er body, is because sin by its nature is addictive. Sin by its nature wants to master you. It is addictive. And to all of you who are super spiritual right now and you're ready to send this message to somebody else like, hey, that's for that heroin addict that really needs this. I have been saved my whole life and I floated into church today and I had communion for breakfast and I really didn't need this. Okay, all right, if that's you, I want you to explain to me uh, Romans chapter 7, what Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse number 21. This is the apostle Paul who wrote most of your New Testament. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 7. Y'all got it in that bite-sized font. Y'all know I'm getting old. I need, I got my glasses on. Can you make it bigger there? Never mind. I'll read it here. Look at what Paul said. He says, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? That is Paul being open and vulnerable, saying, yes, I'm an apostle, and yes, I'm writing the Bible that you're going to read, but I still live in this body of flesh, and it is a war on the inside of me to not become subjugated to the sin nature that wants to master me. And I love that he talks about the battle, but then he has a praise break right after the battle. He says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord. He's talking about the struggle. He's talking about the battle that all of us are susceptible to being addicts 
of anything. Here's what I found out. Addiction is often the fruit. Addiction is often the symptom. The root of the problem is idolatry. The root of every addiction is really idolatry. Addiction is a worship problem. Because whatever you're addicted to is what you're constantly thinking about. It's what you easily go to. At the root of every addiction is the issue of idolatry because we are allowing something besides God to control troll us. That's why you got to be careful what you think you're free to do. Because every addict was first free to do what they now can't stop doing. This is the challenge of sin. The challenge of sin is first you do it, and then it does you. It becomes your master. It controls you. And all of us have that within us to be mastered, to be ruled. At the root of all addiction is idolatry. This is why I will never apologize for us praising God exuberantly. I was telling them today, you can turn up the volume. I will never apologize for jumping up and down in worship, for praising God. I'm never apologizing for being generous and forgiven. And here's why. Because I watched a lot of y'all. I watched all y'all at the Taylor Swift concert. I watched y'all at the Drizzy concert. I watched y'all at the Beyonce concert. All y'all gladly gave in the offering there. I saw people losing their mind in arenas for Taylor Swift, for Drizzy, for Beyonce. I ain't judging you. I'm just saying the reason there was something in you that got dressed, that got ready, that put on all that glitter, that started shaking and dancing and were unashamed to do it. The reason why you excited about your favorite sports team and you have no problem losing your mind in an arena is because God put that in you. He put it in us to worship. He put it in us to adore, but it's got to be put in the right direction. (laughs) All of us are worshipers. Every single one of us worships something. It's never a question of, are you going to worship? It's always a question of what will you worship? So I want to ask you, what are you addicted to? <laughs> See, that's, that's a bad question. Because if I ask that question, you immediately go to the person that's strung out on the hardest drug. You're like, oh, I'm not them. Look at me. I came to church looking good. No, I'm not them. Okay, better, better question. Um, what are you mastered by? Yeah. Actually, let's go deeper because that's, that's too much for some of y'all. Um, here's the question. What do you consistently and easily bow to? If you want some blues clues as to what you might be addicted to, look at what you consistently and easily bow to. Because addiction at its root is idolatry and it's all about worship. What do you consistently bow to? Whatever you consistently and easily bow to, that's what you're addicted to. What, what, what do you bow to? What do you consist? But it's legal. I know, but what do you consistently bow? What, what, what do you consistently bow to? Have I hit yours yet? What, what do you consistently Yeah, you first took the pills for the accident, but the accident is long gone, and now you can consistently bow to what on your computer late at night, staring at video after video, deleting your browser history. What what do you bow to? I know yours not pornography, but you on the screen, and you're clicking on Amazon because... No, yeah, yours isn't, yours isn't lust. My goodness, that's gross. You, you, just, you just consistently buy and your bow is to Amazon. Even when it comes to your front door, you still... What, what, what do you consistently bow to? Just gambling your life savings or what? All of us bow to something. We all, it's the thing you consistently, what, what, 
thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. It's the thing that you consistently bow to. So, of course, we judge the heroin addict. Oh, oh my goodness. Are you serious? But you, you don't realize that your, your needle is the one that you pull out all the time. <sighs> Trying to get a digital hit of dopamine. And have you ever looked at your screen time to see? <laughs> is that how much time I spend? But it's the thing that I consistently and easily bow to. Oh, now I know why God loves addicts. Now I know why God is obsessed with addicts. The reason God loves addicts is because every addict is a worshiper. Every addict is somebody that has bowed their head to something consistently and easily. And God knows that the fact that you got addicted proves that you are hardwired for worship. The fact that you got addicted to it means that your soul actually wants to be taken captive by something. So the reason God loves addicts because he knows that if that addiction can get all your attention, if he could ever get the same amount of attention, if he could ever switch your addiction, if he could ever get you to run to his spirit like you ran to that bottle, if he could ever get you to light up over his word like you light up when your ex texts you, if he could ever get you to run to church like you run to the pill, he would get the best worshiper he's ever seen and hell would be nervous. We just got to switch your addiction I wish I had some Jesus addicts in this place that aren't ashamed to open up your mouth and lift up your hands and give him the praise guess who I want to be addicted to no wonder he loves addicts every addict is just a worshiper that's got to switch their attention. No wonder he loves addicts because he knows that if that can take you captive and leave you bound, if you would ever let me take you captive, if you ever gave yourself fully to me like you gave yourself to that, I could do something incredible in your life. Our God is obsessed with addicts because in addiction, is a worship problem and he wants your gaze he wants your attention our God loves addicts because he is the great liberator who specializes in setting people free if you don't believe that God is a great liberator you better ask the children of Israel who for 400 years had themselves in shackles and chains and they were slaves they were addicts to a system in Egypt and after 400 years God liberated them and set them free use Moses at his mouthpiece to tell Pharaoh let my people go because God is a liberator and he wants to set you free. How do you know they were addicts? Because they tried to go back. Isn't that crazy? The thing that God pulled them out of, they were crying. We so sick of Egypt. Lord, please get us out of here. Lord, if you ever get me out of this. You know that prayer you pray, Lord, if you just ever get me out of this. You ever pray that 911 prayer? God, I promise this is the last time. Just get me out of this. And he gets you out. And isn't it crazy that they were feeling to go back to Egypt because it became their addiction. That's what they were addicted to. And God, the great liberator, all throughout the Old Testament, you see him trying to pull his people away from other gods and other idols, trying to let them know those idols are going to keep you more bound. But I'm the only one that has captivity that actually brings you liberty and freedom. Look at what our God does in Luke chapter 4. I'm going to read it, but before I read it, let me set it up. It's a powerful, powerful moment in Scripture. Jesus, he goes into the temple, and the Bible says that he was given a scroll. This isn't abnormal because in that time period, they would divide up the Torah between different families because the scrolls were so precious in the synagogue and they would divide up the Torah between different families and it was the family's responsibility to hold on to their section of the Torah. 
And they would come into the synagogue on certain days and it was your responsibility to read the section that had been given to your family. And Jesus steps into the synagogue in Luke chapter 4 and he is about to read the section that would have been allotted to him and his family. And of all the verses that were given to him, he quotes Isaiah chapter 61. Let's look at it in, verse, in Luke chapter 4. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And after he read that, he just sat down in the temple. Are you kidding me? Of all the things that Jesus could have read, of all the portions of the Old Testament to be allotted to him he gets Isaiah 61 that says this is a God who has an anointing to preach the good news to the poor and to preach liberty to the captives but it doesn't just stop at proclamation it goes to emancipation and he says I came to set the captives free do you think God can't set you free when he said this is what I was put on earth to do he said this scripture is fulfilled in me to that I am the great liberator. No wonder God loves addicts. It's because he loves setting people free. So I want to ask you today, how does addiction start? How does addiction start? Maybe you're in here and your addiction has gotten farther than you wanted it to go. And you're asking yourself, how did I get here? I think it's important to ask yourself, where did, a, did it start? How, how does addiction start? Addiction, I used to thought, think it started with temptation, but it doesn't start with temptation. Addiction starts with deception. It's deception. It goes actually like this. Deception, temptation, sin, habitual sin, addiction. One more time for those of y'all that was sleeping in the back. I'm going to rewind it. <laughs> Deception, temptation, sin, habitual sin, and now you're addicted. But it started with deception. And here's the deception. It's not a big deal. It's just small. This is going to bring me peace. I need this to relax. It ain't that bad. Oh, here, I ain't doing it like they doing it. I mean, I ain't way out there. Mine's just little. My, it starts with deception. Let me see if I can break it down. God always makes sure, make sure that my personal life gives you an illustration. Uh, many of you will know that this week uh, something happened. This actually last week something happened in our family. We had a new addition, new addition uh, in our family. Not a child. No, don't clap. Uh, <laughs> We, 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 got, we got another dog. We got another dog, y'all. We got another dog. And you have to know, I am not a dog person, okay? Matter of fact, I told my beautiful bride when we got married, I said, I don't do animals, no dogs. Since then, we have two dogs. We've had squirrels. We've had parakeets. We've had bunnies. We've had birds. We've had all kinds of animals. Proof that I don't have any control uh, in my home. So we got a golden doodle first, Theo. I have tolerated him for six years. He's not my favorite. He needs deliverance, and I still have issues with him. <laughs> but we got a new dog. Ooh, his name is Bruno. Can y'all put Bruno on the screen? That's what I said. <laughs> y'all, you don't understand. I get what you dog lovers go through now because Bruno is different. No, he's not like, he's not like the, oh, this dog. He loves me. I come in the house. He runs up to me right to my feet. He licks my face. He is the cutest little thing. I look forward to coming home to Bruno every single day. He is the best dog. He's smart. He obeys, unlike Theo. I love Bruno. Have the best time with Bruno. I let Bruno come in my car. Let him just chill. Go on a ride with me. I love little Bruno. He's so sweet. Licks my little face. Having the best time with Bruno until two nights ago. <laughs> Bruno's been amazing. He's been a stellar dog until two nights ago. Two nights ago, Bruno 
got a little bone. They gave him his little bone, and he's there with his bone. And I go to take the bone away from Bruno. I don't know if you noticed, he's a little rat roller. I go to take the bone away from Bruno to put him in his crate. My little sweet, cute Bruno, when I went to take that bone away, he looked back and went, Pow! I said, Bruno, this is not you. Don't do that. Don't do that. Remember, remember you were licking my face and licking my paw? I go back to take the bone again. This one. I said, oh, Taylor, come get your dog. Because I forgot that this is a Rottweiler. And although he is cute, and although he is small, and although I love him, and although he is my pet, and although that is the cutest little face right now at 12 weeks, I cannot forget, and that little growl reminded me, this is Bruno right here. No, I've seen his mama and his daddy. That is a preview of a coming attraction. That little is going to turn into that. And if I don't get this little thing under control, if I don't teach him now who his master is, I'm going to be walking around my whole house scared, trying to figure out where to sit. Now you tell me where to sit. I'll sit. Okay, we're here. In my own home. Because that which starts off so small always grows to something larger. I'm pleading with somebody in here today to let you know that deception is always the genesis of addiction. You think it's so small. You think it's so cute. You think you can handle it until it becomes your master. I'm not preaching this as somebody who's standing at a distance going, this is something y'all got to work through. I preach this as somebody who knows what it's like to wrestle with addiction. It's addicted to pornography. And it started off small. Small. It started off with 11-year-old Robert going to check the mail one day. And in the mail was a Victoria's Secret catalog. And that's what piqued my interest. I said, wait a minute, I like what I see. How many of you know, natural reaction for me to find attraction. This is what the enemy always preys upon. The enemy wants you to fulfill a legitimate desire in the wrong way. So often he will prey on our natural longings for peace, for love, for joy, for comfort, but he wants you to fulfill it in an illegitimate way outside of God. And he'll tell you, this will give it to you more than God can. And what started with the Victoria's Secret catalog, small, grew and grew and grew and sought to destroy my marriage until I got to the place where I said, I am tired of being mastered by this. And I got to the place that somebody has to get to where I said, I've got to come clean and come out of secrecy and hiding and come out of denial and say, this is an issue and I need help. That's the challenge for some of you. The first step is just to get it out of secrecy. No wonder it's growing. No wonder it's festering. The enemy wants you to keep quiet. He wants you to keep it in the dark. Because God cannot heal that which you keep trying to cover and conceal. I'm telling you, anything that you expose our God, because he loves you, will cover. But anything you keep trying to cover, God will expose. And the exposure is not to destroy you. It's because he loves you and he doesn't want you stuck in the cycle of addiction. I'm going to ask the worship team to come, but when I think of addiction and I look at the word of God, I think of this man in Mark chapter number five. If there was ever a movie that Hollywood 
should release on Halloween about a man in the Bible. It should be this man in Mark chapter 5. He's got to be one of the scariest figures in the Bible that Jesus encounters. And I almost have issue with Mark because Mark doesn't tell us how he got to the place he was in. That's the challenge with judging people with addictions is sometimes you don't understand how they even got there. The Bible tells us how Jesus got there before he encountered this man. Read it when you get to the crib in Mark chapter 5. Jesus is with his disciples. And he says, hey, let's go to the other side. And they get ready to go to the other side. And when I used to preach this passage, I would preach the other side. I'd be like, whoo, how many know if God said you're going to get to the other side, you're going to get to the other side. There is a promise on the other side. And oh, I'd preach the other side like the other side was your dream, your business, your spouse, your house. Oh, get to the other side. But how many know you got to study the Bible, not just the languages, not just the context. You got to study the geography. And I studied the geography. Whoo. And I found out the other side was Gentile territory. The other side for the disciples was this place that they had been avoiding their entire life. And they didn't want to go. It was the place and the people they had been avoiding their entire life. And Jesus was trying to reveal to them, I don't just love the Jews. I love Gentiles too. I fill in the blank for all people. God will often take you to the other side to let you know the width and the breadth of his love. They get ready to go to the other side. Can you see them with an attitude? Think about the people you don't like. Think about your hater. Can you imagine God said, hey, let's go to their house. And on the way there, a storm breaks out, which probably to them is evidence we ain't supposed to go over there. See? <laughs> It's a storm. Come on, imagine. God telling you go to your hater's house and all of a sudden your car won't start. You're like, well, Lord, I tried. A storm breaks out on the way to the other side that they don't want to go to, to the people they don't even like. And in the storm, Jesus adds insult to injury because he's sleeping. Now they're mad. I know you don't care about us. Making us go to the other side, to a place we don't like, to people we don't like. And now a storm's breaking out and you're sleeping. Don't you care? And he gets up in the storm, cool, calm, and collected. Says, peace. Be still. And the winds and the waves stop. They get to the other side, but before they do, they marvel and say, who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey him? But right there on the shore waiting for them on the other side is a man who, to, to me, personifies addiction because his life is a mess. He's in isolation. The Bible says that he was naked, which means he had shame. I can see his hair that hasn't been combed. I can smell the terrible stench of a man who hasn't been in community. The Bible says that he lived among the tombs. His home was the cemetery. That's where he stayed. And I don't know, it's just the way my mind works. Nobody's supposed to be in isolation living in a cemetery, but I'm just wondering, how did he get to this place? Life doesn't end up like this. How did he get to this place? I'm wondering, did he lose somebody at the cemetery? And the pain of that trauma is what kept him there. You got to be real careful who you turn up your nose at. You don't know the trauma and the pain that has brought some people to the place that they are. How I many you know trauma does not excuse behavior, but it sure will explain behavior sometimes it'll let you know why the person is doing what they're doing Bible says he's cutting himself with stones it's one of the only people in the Bible that we see doing self-harm that's what addiction does it makes you harm yourself and yet this man sees Jesus as he comes across 
the shore and he lands and I can see his disciples with an attitude they don't even want to be on this part of the town and notice what the man does when he sees Jesus it says he saw Jesus from afar off and he ran and he worshipped him he ran right to where he was and he lay down and worshipped him look at him he's full of demons and yet when Jesus shows up he falls down and worships him I came to tell somebody you need to switch your addiction don't ever let the addiction make you run away from the presence of God take some notes from this man run to him run to his presence run to him he fell at his feet and he worshiped look how conflicted he is he's worshiping but the demons in him cried out with a loud voice and said what have I to do with you Jesus son of the most high God I implore you by God that you do not torment me this man is possessed this is a spirit hear me I'm not saying every person that has an addiction is demon possessed but I am saying every addiction does have a spiritual connection to it and some of you need to understand there is a spirit that the enemy has launched against you to get you to keep damaging yourself to get you stuck in that cycle and you need to wake up and open up your eyes and know that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they're mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds you can have a good AA meeting but you need more than that you better seek the power and the presence of God this is a spiritual issue he's not just trying to take you out he's trying to take out your children and your children's children he's trying to take out a generation and the church has got to stop playing games and realize this is warfare this is warfare a spiritual issue and he comes to Jesus and even the demons know who Jesus is they declared son of the most high God even demons know who Jesus is and he fell down and he worshipped him and Jesus the great liberator says come out of him you unclean spirit come out of him I love the power of our God here's what I love about God how many of you know he can set you free in a moment he can set you free in an instant I have seen it I have seen people addicted to things for years and in one moment they never had a taste for it again but how many of you know he'll do it instantaneous but he'll also do it through a process he'll do it day by day he has the power to do it both ways he says come out of him and even after that, he asked him a critical question. He says, uh, what is your name? This is one of the only places I've seen in scripture where Jesus asked the person's name as he's delivering them. What is your name? He says, we are legion. and We are many. In other words, I got all kinds of issues. I got this and this and this. And Jesus is asking his name because he knows that there is nothing like addiction that attaches itself to your identity to the point you think that what you are doing is who you are. And I came to make an announcement to somebody today. You are not what you are doing. As a matter of fact, even when the enemy is trying to get you to go to it, you need to start declaring over yourself, I am a child of God. I am the righteousness of Christ. Christ Jesus speak to your identity so many times we deal with behavior modification but we don't speak to the identity of who we are what is your name Jesus cast the demons out of this man but before he does the demons beg they ask they said Lord please don't send us out of the region just send us into those pigs over there notice the demons just didn't want to leave the area they didn't mind leaving him but they wanted to stay in the area because demons and demonic spirits want to rule over regions and households and last names and so I don't mind leaving him but don't let me leave the region Lord send us into those pigs and Jesus gives them permission to go into a herd of pigs and the pigs run off a cliff into the water that made me shout. That made me shout. Not just because I don't eat bacon. That made me shout. It made me shout because the demons had to ask permission from God of where to go. 
And I don't know who this is for, but can I tell you, there is no spirit that is not subject to the authority of our God. You need to know that our God has all power, that he reigns supreme. Don't you ever be afraid of demonic oppression or possession when you know that there is power. We sang it earlier. In the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Somebody needs to walk in your house today and in your child's bedroom and start declaring the name that is above every name. I speak Jesus over my family. I speak Jesus over my children. I speak the name of Jesus over my marriage. I speak the name of Jesus over the city of Dallas. I speak the name of Jesus in our culture. I speak the name that is above every name. There is power in that name. Oh, you better know what name has the power that even demons have to ask permission for where they can go. They say, can we go into the pigs? Jesus gives permission. He says, you can go into the pigs. And the pigs jump off the cliff because addiction always wants to destroy your life. Another crazy thing happens in the text. The people that owned the herd of pigs got so mad that they asked Jesus to leave the region. Jesus has just set a man free. This man gets clothed and in his right mind. And the people in the region, especially the people that owned the pigs, said, Jesus, can you leave our region? I need to warn some of you that God is about to set you free from that addiction. There are people connected to you that don't want you free. There are people connected to you that want you stuck in the cycle because they are benefiting from your addiction. They are benefiting from the stronghold. They are benefiting. It is a codependent relationship. And some of you, the greatest freedom you'll ever get is from the people that are tied to the thing that you are addicted to. Not everybody wants your liberty. They ask Jesus to leave the region. The request of the man is what got my attention. He's been set free. The Bible says he's now clothed because God will cover up the shame. He's in his right mind. And he goes, Jesus, you're about to leave. He grants their request. He's like, y'all want me to leave? Okay, I'll go back to the other side. And this man goes, can I go with you, Jesus? Let me go. And look at what Jesus says. Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he's had compassion on you. Jesus, I'm confused. You granted the request of the demons that said, send me into the pigs. You granted the request of the people and said, hey, you messing up my business. Go back to the other side. Why don't you grant the request of this man who was an addict and is now set free? Why wouldn't you let him go with him? He said, no, 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 no. You can't go with me because I need your testimony to spread across this region. You, because of your addiction, have been in isolation and I know you want to come with me, but the best thing you can do is to get back in community and tell everybody you meet the power of what I did in your life because everybody in this town knew that you were the one that walked around naked and that had scars. Everybody in the town knew your business. Who am I preaching to? God will let your bad news get around town so that when he sets you free, the good news of what he's done will change somebody's life so you can look at them and say, yeah, I'm the same one that used to be in the club. Yeah, I'm the same one that used to be shooting up. Yeah, I'm the same one that used to sleep around. Look at me. I'm married now. I got a family now. I'm addicted to his presence now. Oh, we are overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Jesus, Jesus goes, I'm not going to rob you of the most powerful thing that any believer has. Your story, your testimony, your testimony is going to do more damage to the kingdom of darkness than you would ever do getting on the boat with me with these other 12 dudes that I'm still working on. 
I want you to go tell everybody in this region the power of what I've done in your life. It breaks my heart, just real soft. It breaks my heart when I look at the multiplicity of things people can be addicted to. But then when I understand that God loves addicts and he is the great liberator, it reminds me that for every addiction, there is a possible story and testimony of somebody to stand and proclaim, God set me free from this. Go home. Go to your community. Tell your friends and your family what I've done. Would you stand to your feet today? I'm going to ask that nobody leave. Addiction. Put you in isolation. Isolation from God. Isolation from the people that you love. Oftentimes we talk about the spiritual, but we don't talk about the practical of good community that will hold you accountable so you don't get stuck in the cycle. I'm thankful that God set me free, but I still had to be open and honest and have boundaries and community. Be transparent and vulnerable with my wife and say, hey, here's all my devices. Look at it, I wanna be free. And over time, there's not even a desire there, but even then I still have boundaries of healthy community of surrendering all that I am to God. So many times we talk about restraint, don't do that, don't do that, but we don't talk about surrendering all that you are to Him. Addiction is a worship problem. The study they did years ago, they call it the Rat Park Study. They were trying to study addiction and they would put a rat in a cage with two different water bottles and one water bottle had cocaine in it. And they were trying to see which water bottle the rats would choose. And in the cage, the rat always went to the water bottle that had cocaine and would overdose. And they kept looking at study after study, rat after rat overdosing. Until one person in the study said, the problem is the cage. You didn't put anything else in the cage but the two water bottles. The person said, why don't you put a rat park and put some tunnels in there and put a little Ferris wheel in there. And by the way, you got the rat in there by itself. Put some other rats in there and put the rat in community and put the rat in a different environment. And then when you put the rat in a different environment with other options, then see if it goes to the water bottle that has the cocaine in it. And when they change the environment and they got the rat in community, every time the rat actually went to the water bottle that was healthy and rejected the water bottle that had a cocaine in it and I'm trying to tell you that is a picture of you and I it's not just what you abstain from it's what you're surrendered to and you've got to surrender yourself to God and get yourself in the right community get yourself with somebody that's going to hold you accountable I'm talking to somebody today that because your little addiction has gone from puppy to full-grown Rottweiler, you're going to have to do some drastic things. If you have to move to a different part of the city, move to a different part of the city. If you have to have no internet and a flip phone, have no internet and a flip phone. Do whatever you have to do to not get stuck in the cycle of deception temptation, sin, habitual sin, addiction. Start with the truth. And the truth is God is a liberator and he loves addicts because he loves setting people free. I'm going to ask every head be bowed and eyes be closed today. Father, I thank you for this moment. Lord, I thank you that you are still 
setting the captives free. So Lord, I pray for my brother, I pray for my sister who feels like that man who was in the tombs. They feel the shame. They feel isolated. They don't even know how it's gotten this bad. Lord, let today be their emancipation day. Let today be the first step of their freedom. And Lord, let their freedom start with not denying the, power, the problem or even trying to rely on our own strength. God, we can. We need your power. But Lord, set us free today. In the name of Jesus. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed today. I need to know who I came for. If you're here today and you've never, first of all, surrendered your life to Jesus, today's your day. God loves you. He's not mad at you. He's not upset with you. He hates the sin that is destroying his image in you and on you. And you don't have to get yourself together to come to him. You come to him just as you are. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and say, Pastor Robert, I've never surrendered my life to Jesus, but today I need to respond. I need to give him my life. I'd love to include you in this closing prayer. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand high enough and long enough to where I could see and say, today's the day I'm giving him my life and I'm coming home. Yeah, I see that hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Hands are going up all over this place today. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Anybody else? Thank you, God. Come on, the day you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. You know when he's speaking to you. I'm talking to somebody that's watching me right now online. You're watching this on the YouTube replay and you wonder why you can't stop watching this. It's because God has your attention and he wants you to surrender your life to him. Anybody else just lift it up and put it right back down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. If you're here today and you'd be so honest and say, you know what? I'm trapped in a cycle. I'm trapped in an addiction. And today, I need liberty. I need freedom. I believe today's your day. That man that was in the tombs, they tried to chain him. They tried, but it didn't work until he encountered the real and the living Savior. Today is your day. He wants to set you free. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand high enough and long enough to where I can see and say, today I need, I need liberty, I need freedom. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Here's what I want us to do. I want the worship team just to begin to lead us in, pr in praise and in worship. But if you lifted up your hand for either one of those, I'm going to ask you to do something so bold and so brave. I don't want you to worry what anybody else thinks about you. This is between you and God. I want you, when I count to three, just to get out of your seat and come find a place right here at this altar. I want this to be the shore, just like that man met Jesus. And I'm believing today, some of you before our prayer team or anybody even lays hands on you, you're going to experience the freedom and the liberating power of our God who sets captives free. So when I count to three, if you lifted up your hand or you should have lifted up your hand, come on, I just want you to come right up here to the front. Don't don't worry about what somebody else thinks. I don't care if you're all the way in the back. It's worth every step. Come on, I want you to come. One, come on, two, three. I want you to come. This is your day. This is your day. Come on. Come on, come on. Come on, I'm tired of this cycle. I'm tired of this routine. Come on, every addict is just a worshiper that's got to switch their focus. That's got to switch their attention. Come on. Come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Thank you, God. Get as close to the front as you can. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, come on. Would you come with your hands lifted and lift them up to this Savior? Come on, that has the power to break every single chain. Come on. To break every chain. Come on, if you know that you need this freedom, I want you to come. There is power in the name of Jesus. He whom the sun sets free is free indeed. There is power in the name of Jesus. 
Surrender yourself to him today. I hear the chains falling. Come on, give him every aspect of you today. I hear the chains falling. Thank you. God. In his presence, I hear. I hear the chains falling. I hear the chains falling. place can you just lift up your hands in the same way addiction has a way of shaping our brains and shaping our bodies especially when it's been going on for a long time it makes me understand what Paul said when he says I present my body to God as a living sacrifice. All that I am. One of the most powerful things you can do even after this moment is every day you wake up is to start your day by physically saying, God, I give you every aspect of me. God, I give you these hands. Let these hands glorify you. God, I give you my eyes. Let these eyes look on things that are holy and pure. God, I give you my mind. Let my mind think thoughts that are from above. God, I give you my feet. God, let these feet walk into places that bring you glory and honor. Start presenting your body to him. Giving him all of you. So I want to lead us in this prayer as one big family. We're all going to pray it. But if you want to stay here and linger and worship, we're going to do that. Our prayer team is going to just make their way through here. They're going to lay hands and pray for some of you. But even before they do, I want you to make this declaration. I want you to pray this prayer because God wants to change your name. You are not that addiction. You are his beloved son and his beloved daughter. And before there's any behavior change, there must be an identity change declares I am your child so come on with your hands lifted can we pray this prayer and say Jesus come on declare it say Jesus I give you all of me Lord today I confess I cannot do life without you I need you Lord I know you came from heaven to earth to live the life that I was supposed to live. You died the death that I was supposed to die. 
you took my place. Lord, I thank you that you came to set the captives free. So today, I receive my freedom. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean. Make me brand new. From this moment forward, I'm walking with you. Whole and in freedom.